um, and, a, and a, just a shared understanding in general sort of set the table. Uh, and then an, an example that's maybe more directly relevant to the work that a lot of us are doing in terms of providing online instruction. I'm gonna do my level best to save a pretty good chunk of time at the end to answer your questions specifically. So if you have an immediate question, hey, you use that term and I wanna know what that means, drop that in the chat, add that to the document, unmute and ask that question directly and I'll try to answer it. If there's a, a bigger question, we're trying this program and I wanna ask something about it or I got a question I don't know the answer, I'm gonna do my best to, to leave some time to address those questions explicitly. So feel free to drop those in the chat, um, add those beside your name or there's also a section further down that says your questions with some empty bullets where you can add those specific questions as well. So without further ado, um, let's, let's sort of jump into the materials themselves. I might try to share my screen and see how that goes. I am screen sharing now according to my computer. Um, could somebody give me a thumbs up or, or unmute and say, yes, we can see your screen or something like that to make sure that in fact I have successfully shared my screen? Yep, we can see it. Hooray, great, okay. I so, so a first sort of silly example here as a way to think about copyright is this tweet that, that made me smile this morning. Um, somebody was out walking around their neighborhood, they saw a for sale sign and it had this sort of interesting comment at the top, not haunted. And they thought that was funny, they took a picture of it, they posted it to Twitter. Um, I thought it was funny, I thought it was a nice way to introduce some copyright topics. So I've decided to borrow this photograph of somebody else's work and share it in this educational context with you all. And the question I wanted to ask, and I'll, I'll sort of uh, answer this one a little bit, but you, you all should feel free to jump in. Um, and then the second one will hopefully be a little bit more collaborative. The question is, am I in trouble? Am I gonna get sued and lose my house and, and go to jail and you know, spend the rest of my life regretting the fact that without getting permission from anybody, I shared this picture or not? And of course, the, the short answer is no, it, it, it's probably okay because I chose to do it. And that theme is a theme I'm going to share a lot over the next hour or so, which is copyright is not as confusing as you might think it is. And it's definitely not as scary as some people often think that it is. That copyright is generally a system that's at, at its base somewhat commonsensical once you sort of understand the way it, it works. And that copyright loves what you do educators, librarians, those sorts of folks that are sort of work in service of the public good by sharing information. Copyright is a system that understands the unique value you provide and has set up a bunch of rules to support that work. So I, I hope you notice this theme as we keep talking. Copyright loves what you do and it's trying to support the stuff that you're doing. So how do we dig into that theme a little more? The other thing I want to share with you today sort of at an overarching level is just below this discussion of I want to buy a house is this set of what I call five plus one questions. And I've got a link here to uh, the book chapter where, where somebody that I've worked with in the past, Kevin Smith, shares these five questions in some detail. But I want to suggest that anytime you ask a question or you are asked a question, how does copyright work here? Should I be concerned that if you follow these five questions as sort of an order of operations, you'll come to a pretty good answer? Um, and this is the quick version. If you want to read the whole chapter, it's linked there, open access as well. But those five questions are, is the thing I want to use protected by copyright at all? Is there a license, some sort of permission, that, that permits me to use it in the way I want to? Is there a specific exception in the copyright law, in the statutes or in the way judges talk about it, that permits my use? Is my use permitted by this specific exception, fair use, that we're going to spend some time talking about? And then, do I need permission? And if the answer to, is no to some of those other questions, maybe you, you, you do need permission. And then if so, how can I get it? And then the sixth question I've sort of added to the end as a plus one there is, is less a legal question than sort of a, a risk assessment question or, a, or a, an overall question, who's gonna be mad if I do this? And if the answer is nobody really cares if you do this, um, think about the law and be deliberate about that, but let that flavor the way you do your legal analysis. And on the other hand, if you know there's somebody out there who's gonna be furious if I do this, that doesn't mean the answer is no, but that means you really wanna be sure as you're thinking through those other questions as well. So that's sort of a, a frame for those five questions. 
So armed with those five questions, let's, let's go back to my query above about sharing this photograph or not. And let's start with the first question. Is this thing protected by copyright? And when I raised that question to you, I, I framed it very specifically to make a note that this thing actually represents several things brought together. Um, as you probably know, copyright is nothing more than the right to control making copies and sharing things. Um, and copyright happens just sort of automatically. Um, as soon as a pencil touches a piece of paper, as soon as my finger clicks the, the shutter on my camera, that thing is protected by copyright. As soon as a work that is original, meaning you made it and not somebody else, and at least a little bit creative, meaning there's something of your own creativity in there, that thing is protected by copyright. So that means if while during this webinar, you're also on Twitter back channeling and going like, oh my God, this is so boring. I can't believe I signed up for this. When will this guy shut up? Good news, you're a rights holder. You own copyright in that snarky tweet. Um, so what that means in this case is probably that for sale sign in the picture is protected by copyright, at least a little bit. There's not a lot of originality in the sort of the image of the houses there in the text, but there's maybe some. Um, there's a separate level of copyright in the photograph that this person took in it. And there's maybe a sort of a third layer of copyright in the text above the, the photograph. This just went up around the corner and I have so many questions. So the question, is this protected by copyright is maybe better understood as what elements of this thing in front of me are protected by copyright? And if so, how? And so answering that question is gonna mean answering the question, is there copyright in the sign? Well, I, I think probably so. It's, it's what we might call a thin copyright in the business, but there's a little bit of copyright there. So if I wanna reuse this in the presentation I'm doing for you right now, I need to think a little bit about copyright in the sign. There's definitely copyright in the photograph of the sign. The person right, used, used a camera, they used their own creativity to pick the way to frame it. Um, so that's a second level of copyright. And then there's certainly a little bit of creativity in what that person has written as well. This just went up around the corner and I have so many questions. It's important to note though that there are a lot of things copyright doesn't protect that are also relevant here. Copyright, for example, doesn't uh, protect the shape of the sign, although somebody might argue that that's a sculpture that deserves copyright protection. The law would probably say no. The fact that you have these sort of cross beams holding up the sign and the, the sign itself is a rectangle, that's not protected by copyright. Um, individual words and short phrases generally aren't protected by copyright, so not haunted at the top is not protected by copyright. Ideas are also not protected by copyright. So if you wanted to sort of tell the story about this person coming on this sign and describe what happened, no copyright protection there, no reason you can't tell that story. If you wanted to make your own funny sign or your own funny picture of a made up for sale sign with not haunted at the top because that amused you in some way, also not protected by copyright. The idea of a for sale sign with a not haunted above it is not protected. So the only things we need to worry about are the, the, the sort of the graphic on the sign, the photograph and the text there. Everything else you can use and you don't even need to worry about copyright in the first place at all. So I find that helps sort of uh, organize my thoughts in terms of answering this question about copyright. A lot of this stuff I don't need to worry about in the first place. These are the things that I do and there probably is copyright. So the answer to my first question is yes, it defined in the ways I just did is protected by copyright. So I'll say yes, the photo, and the text, and maybe the sign. So the next question is, okay, some of that stuff is protected by copyright. Can I use it or not? And the answer to that question is related to the issue of whether there's a license that covers my use or not. Um, a license, of course, is copyright lingo for somebody saying it's okay, somebody giving you permission, and a license can happen in a lot of different ways. I chose this image in particular because it illustrates two different kinds of licenses that we bump into a lot. The first license that probably applies here is because this is on Twitter, Twitter has a set of terms of service that permit certain types of sharing. When you post something to Twitter, you agree to use Twitter's platform. You give Twitter the right to do certain things, to archive, to save in REM, to, to share in different ways. And you also give downstream users certain rights to do something like hit the retweet button, for example. 
So somebody tweets something and you hit retweet, there's no copyright issue there because you have a license that permits you to do that. The answer to the first question, is it protected, might be yes. But once you get to the second question, you've got a license, you've got permission, you're done. You can ignore the rest of the questions. Hitting, hitting the retweet button doesn't raise significant issues. So when I saw this and I liked it and I retweeted it, I wasn't worried about copyright for those, those reasons. There was a license that covered that kind of use. That license, however, doesn't necessarily cover downloading the image, uploading it into a Google Doc, and then sharing it with people on a webinar. So there is a license out there, but it doesn't necessarily cover that sort of use. So we keep going. A second type of license that applies here, and this is one that, that's sort of out there a lot, but not always written, is this idea of an implied license. There are certain things you do that create the implication that it's okay to do something. Um, if I walk around playing my music in a public park, a public performance is a copyright issue, but I've created an implied license for people to sort of listen to that and engage that in certain ways. And somebody might argue that when, when something is tweeted in a public space like this, there's an implied license to use it. Or similarly, that when the real estate company put up this for sale sign, they created an implied license for people to take a picture of it, right? It's out in public. Um, they're not really commercializing the sign itself. They're just hoping people will see it to make them aware that this house is for sale. So in a sense, they're hoping a lot of people will see this and copy it and share it with other people. So you might argue that there's some sort of implied license, uh, certainly to take a picture of the sign itself. And then maybe to share the tweet in different ways as well, although the existence of a specific license in Twitter maybe makes that harder to do. So the answer to the license question is, there are maybe some licenses, but they probably don't give us full confidence in our ability to do the sort of sharing that I've done here. So we probably want to look a little further. As a side note, if either the photographer, we assume this is uh, Margot here, or the real estate company wanted to remove all doubt, and they said, we want this to be shared far and wide. I hope a million people see this. I hope I became world famous as a result of this photograph I took or this sign I made. Something they could do is attach something called a Creative Commons license. And we can dig into the Creative Commons a lot more if that's interesting to folks. But very quickly, what a Creative Commons license is, is it's a, it's a license that you put on something you've made that you own that takes it from all rights reserved to some rights reserved. It says, I made this thing, but I made it hoping a lot of people would see it and use it. So if you use it in the ways I want you to, you're permitted to do that and you don't need to ask my permission. And they come in a variety of different contexts. A CC BY license, for example, is a license that says, this is my thing, but please use it however you want, as long as I get credit, as long as attribution is attached. A CC NC license is, here's my thing, please use it. But if you commercialize it, if you're trying to make money, come and talk to me, you're gonna need permission for that. So if there had been a CC license on either the photograph or the sign itself, we might be done at that second question as well. There's not, um, I'm not sure that Twitter's license gets us where we wanna go. And the implied license argument is maybe more interesting than persuasive. So the answer to the second question is um, not really with all the caveats that we just talked about, right? There, there is a license, but it doesn't really cover our uses. So that brings us to the third question. And before I jump into the third question, I'm gonna look into chat really fast and see if anybody has asked, has shared any questions. Um, while I take that breath, if you have any questions you wanna ask at this point, uh, feel free to unmute and ask them and I'm gonna zip back into the document as well. I see a lot of folks introducing yourselves. Great to see you all here. I don't see any questions so far, so I'm gonna assume I've either been clear or so confusing that you've given up. And I'm going to keep talking for a little while longer to take us through our five questions. And then after that, we're going to do one of these together as well. So question number three, is there a specific exception that covers my use? This brings us back to the point I made earlier that copyright loves what you do. Oh, I see another question has popped up in chat. Let me see those real fast. Sorry, I've lost my chat here, so um, here we go, sorry. So that was just to ask if you could reshare the link. Um, I, I was not here early enough, Zoom made me update, so. Okay, great, yeah, of course, I'm happy to do that. There's Thank the link you. again, sorry sorry to have taken so long, but, but glad to have you joining us now. Great question, okay, so is it protected? Yes, is there a license that permits us to do the stuff that I wanna do? Not really. 
So the third question to ask then is this, is there a specific exception? And there are a whole host of specific exceptions where Congress and the courts have said, we love libraries. We love educators. We wanna carve out some specific space for you to do the socially valuable stuff that you do. If you really wanna nerd out about it, these tend to be in sections 108 through 110 of the Copyright Act. So you can always Google 17 USC 108, 109 or 110, and you'll see some of those. Um, but basically what those represent are, are places where Congress has said a specific group of people doing a specific set of things shouldn't have to worry about copyright so much. So section 108 is the library exception. Uh, it's the way that we can do things like interlibrary loan, like making copies of damaged materials for preservation, um, making personal copies for patrons who are doing sort of non-commercial scholarly works. All those stuff, all that stuff is possible because Congress has specifically said don't worry about copyright. What you're doing is important. Just do that stuff. Section 109 is what's called the first sale doctrine. It's the reason that if I buy a physical book, I can give it to my friend or give it away or sell it at a used bookstore. And, and so it's also the way that libraries lend our physical collections. It was Congress's way of saying, when you own a physical instantiation of a work that might be protected by copyright, you own that thing and you can do whatever you want with that thing. So all the physical lending that we do exists because of that section 109 exception. Neither of those though help me out very much in this context, neither interlibrary loan nor physical materials help me show you this silly picture that I've chosen. There is a third exception that's maybe more relevant that I wanna spend a minute talking about and that's in section 110. Um, it has to do with performance or display in the course of instructional activities. And it's divided into two sections. Section 110.1 is for face-to-face -face teaching. And section 110.2, sometimes called the TEACH Act, is used for online instruction. These two different parts of this exception are a really interesting study in contrasts. Section 110.1 is it's one paragraph. It's really short and it's very clear. It says it's not a violation of copyright to perform or display, to play a song, to read a play out loud, to show a movie in the course of face-to-face -face instruction, instruction by any nonprofit educational institution, um, as long as it's done with a legal copy in a way that supports your instructional activities. So that's the reason we were all able to stand up and read out loud in the classroom. That's the reason you can show movies in class, in a library instructional space, any other place that's non-commercial and devoted to instruction um, that's limited to people, students enrolled in that course this exception lets you do that stuff. Uh, I sometimes get the question, is, is that all movies? What about Disney movies? And in fact, there's no Disney limitation in that exception. There's nothing different about movies owned by any particular company. There has been a history of some companies and I mentioned Disney deliberately sort of being particularly litigious or threatening and, and trying to sort of bully their way into saying like you, maybe the law says you can show your movie, but we're gonna, be mad at you and send a nasty letter to you. That's not grounded in the law in any way that you can show The Little Mermaid just the same as you can show any other movie out there. So um, if we were in the face-to-face -face classroom and I wanted to show you this picture, we'd be done with the analysis. We'd say, oh, great, we're finished. Um, I am displaying an image, perform or display. It's a legal copy. I found it online according to the terms of Twitter and it supports my pedagogy in, in these ways. I'm showing it to you as a way to illustrate copyright. So we'd be done. We are not face-to-face -face in, in a physical space that we're working in an online space. So instead that kicks us down to this second uh, instructional exception, what's called the TEACH Act. And if I said that 1101, I see a question about 108, I'm excited to get into that as well. Thanks for sharing. Um, if 1101 is clear and concise and broad, 1102, the TEACH Act is exactly the opposite. It's really, really long. It's very, very technical. Um, and it can be pretty complicated to abide by all that you have to do this, you may not do this, you can only do this in this way, etc. cetera. Um, generally speaking, it's designed to recreate the limitations that we described in the face-to-face -face exception. You have to use technical measures to limit it only to enrolled students, for example. You can only uh, show it to people, you can't let them download a copy, that sort of thing. One of the problems with the TEACH Act is because it was written in, to, it was released in 2002, so it was written a year or two before that, it makes a lot of assumptions about technology that don't really align with the way technology works today. Um, so although the TEACH Act might be a solution in some contexts, I'm going to suggest 
I'm not comfortable relying on it here, but I wanted to make sure that you all were aware that when you're working in the physical classroom, you have broad freedom to show, to play, to perform anything you want without worrying about copyright, because that's the sort of thing Congress expects and wants you to do. And when you're in the online environment, you have a sort of similar, although a little bit more nitpicky set of privileges and freedoms as well. So having said all that, I'm gonna say here again, not really. I'm glad I know about those exceptions, but I don't think they solve my problem here. This brings us to the fourth question, and this is often the question that we spend the most time on. Um, that question is, is my use permitted under fair use, the doctrine of fair use? And that's if you've ever seen a copyright presentation before, or if you've ever used YouTube or anything else, you've probably heard the term fair use. Um, I'm going to do sort of the quick version of what is fair use, and then we can dig into that one a little bit more as well. Um, but very, very briefly, if those other exceptions I called specific exceptions because Congress had a particular type of person doing a particular type of thing in mind when they wrote them. If you're a teacher in the classroom playing music, it's okay. Fair use is kind of the exceptional exception. It's the catch-all. It's the one where Congress said, and of course, there are millions of things that we couldn't possibly carve out a specific exception for because we didn't think of them, because when the law was written in 1976, they hadn't been invented yet, because we are, you know, represent a certain type of person and there are other types of people in the world whose issues are just not familiar with us as well. Um, they created fair use as sort of the catch-all. And in fact, I said they created, what really happened is that for more than a hundred years, judges in judge-made law have applied this, this principle of fair use. And that principle was codified, was written into the Copyright Act in 1976, but it has a long history before the Copyright Act as well. And in fact, when we talk about the ways that fair use is kind of squishy, that reflects the fact that this comes from a lot of court decisions rather than from just one sort of bulleted statute. So that's what fair use is. It's the, are you making the world a better place kind of exception in ways that we couldn't necessarily have anticipated when we wrote the law. And the way it works is also different than those specific exceptions because instead of saying, if you are this and you do A, B, and C, check, 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 the exception certainly applies to you. It says, there are a lot of things to think about. These are the sort of questions to consider. And if you're doing this sort of thing, your use is probably fair. And if you're doing this other sort of thing, it's probably not fair. Uh, that's often represented by a set of scales where like if, if you're non-commercial, then that's the fair use scale gets a little heavier. But if you're doing something that makes somebody, you know, put somebody in danger, that changes it the other way. So you often see a set of scales reflecting fair use. I think a better analogy and the one I was given in law school is that doing fair use analysis is a lot like making soup. And that those four factors, the four questions that, that the statute gives us are like the ingredients that you pour into this big bowl of soup. And you pour them in, and if there was ever a lawsuit, what a judge would do is they would like take a big wooden ladle and they'd stir the soup up and they'd taste a little bit and they'd go, hmm, that's good fair use, or oof, that fair use smells really bad. It's just that scientific, it's just that exact. Um, but the, what I hope empowering thing about that is, is it means it's very flexible it gives us space to experiment with and try new things. So let's talk about making fair use soup a little bit, first with the four factors that the statute gives us, and then in the context of this silly photograph that we've been using to illustrate the discussion so far. So the first, what the statute calls the first factor or the first question you should ask yourself is what's the purpose and character of your use? Why are you borrowing somebody else's stuff? And if you're doing that because you want to get rich or rip them off or, or sort of enrich yourself, your fair use soup starts to smell not so good. But if you're doing something to make the world a better place, to provide commentary, critique, analysis, education, your fair use soup smells pretty good. So the good news for most of us on this call is we generally start off with that first factor very much in our favor. Most of what we do in library land is about like serving our patrons and increasing access to information for the public good, not trying to make a million dollars and run off somewhere, right? So fair use supports us sort of from jump, from the first set of questions. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna add these to the chat here as well. What are you doing? Uh, in this case, what I'm doing is providing a, a humorous example of a photograph to explain principles of copyright. I'm gonna suggest that my fair use claim feels pretty good so far. 
I'm using it non-commercially. I'm using just, you know, I'm using it in a way that, that clearly illustrates what I'm talking about, I hope as well. So that's the first question to ask. And, and that question makes me feel pretty good about my fair use claim. The second question to ask yourself is what are you using? And this, this question asks, what are you borrowing from somebody else in a couple of different contexts? Is the thing that you're borrowing from somebody else more factual or more creative? If, the, if that thing is more creative, if it's a poem that somebody's written, that there's more of themselves in there, it's harder to claim fair use and more likely I need to get permission from them because there's more of their sort of spirit and their creativity in it. On the other hand, if there's just a newspaper photograph, right, car accident yesterday, and there's a photograph that was clearly taken quickly to demonstrate that there was a car accident yesterday, the argument goes there's less of that person's personality or creative spark in there, so it's easier to claim fair use. Um, the second sort of piece of that question is whether the work is widely available or not. Um, if, if I release something into the world, it's kind of already out there. The genie's out of the bottle, right? So it doesn't harm me as much if somebody else shares it a little bit further. On the other hand, if you break into my house and steal my diary and publish it, I didn't want people to see that, right? So you've harmed me in a different way. So it's harder to claim fair use for the stolen diary than it is for the newspaper photograph. The other thing to say about this second question or second factor is we have now spent more time talking about it than most courts do. Um, courts spend a lot of time thinking about the first factor. Courts generally don't care as much about the second factor, although there was a big Supreme Court case earlier this week that centered the second factor. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hedge a little bit in very lawyerly fashion when I say that. But, but that second, make sure you're on the right side of that first question. Maybe think about that second question some by and large. So what are you doing? Um, what I've borrowed here is a mostly descriptive photograph of a yard sign. I feel great about the second factor in terms of my fair use claim, right? I borrowed something that's not terribly creative, that was already um, shared to the public through Twitter, millions of people had seen it. I feel great about fair use. My soup is smelling great so far. So those are the first two questions. The third question is, if I can type, how much are you using? And it's easy to think about this in terms of did you use a lot or a little? But a better way to think about that second factor is, did you use the appropriate amount, right? Back in the first factor, you said, I need to borrow this from somebody else without getting their permission because I'm going to make the world a better place when I do it. Maybe in a little way, but teach, you know, teaching people about copyright makes the world a little bit better. I need to borrow this picture. The third factor asks, OK, how much of that other person's work do you need to borrow to do your society serving work? Um, so if I was writing a book review, for example, and I said, this book is garbage. This is the worst book that's ever been written. It's full of jargon. The prose is deadly dull and awful. Here, look at these two lines. And I borrowed two lines from a book to illustrate how bad the writing was. Um, that's just a little bit. So that makes me feel good about my fair use. But it's also the appropriate amount, right? I need to illustrate that the writing is bad, so I need a couple lines. On the other hand, if I said, I want to show you how bad the writing is, here's the whole book reproduced, right? That's way too much. I, that's much more than I needed uh, to make it clear that the writing was bad. On the other hand, if I was doing art critique, for example, I might need the whole image. It might be hard to talk about just the lower left 10% of the work or something, right? But maybe I don't need a high resolution version of it. That third question really is keyed to, you said you're doing something valuable. How much do you really need to do that valuable thing? And again, going back to the example I have here, I think I'm using a pretty appropriate amount. Like in theory, I could have cropped out the, the right side of the picture so it was just the yard sign and zoomed in a little bit. But the test isn't, did you use the very minimum amount that you could? The test was, was, your, was the amount you used reasonable in light of your purpose? So I still think my fair use soup is smelling real, real good here. What I'm doing is society serving. What I'm using is factual and widely available. And I'm using the appropriate amount in order to meet the purpose that I described above. Fair use is feeling very good here. The last question, the last factor that courts ask us to consider is whether your work is a market substitution for the original. If somebody's out there trying to sell something and you're standing right beside them giving that something away for free, it's hard to claim fair use because they're trying to sell it in the world already, right? Um, it's important to say this isn't just about market harm, right? If we go back to my mean-spirited book review a minute ago, if you care about my opinion about books, my book review might persuade you not to buy it. But that persuasion is not about substitution. It's not that you don't need the book anymore. 
It's the, just that I persuade you that the book is bad, right? So this fourth factor is about, are you giving away my book for free so people who want it don't need to buy it from me, not just do you make people less likely to buy my book or not? And again, I I'm feeling really good about fair use here, right? Going back to the, to the sign that we talked about, um, there is not, to my knowledge, a market for this photograph. I don't know anywhere I could go to buy a copy to frame to put in my house. I don't know of a licensing mechanism for this photograph. There is not a market for this work that my work is a substitute for in the first place. So walking through those four factors, I feel great about my fair use determination. Any questions about those four factors so far? Feel free to drop them into the chat, unmute and ask your questions, etc. Um, I'm going to say a little bit more about fair use, but I want to make sure we get a chance to ask questions before I move on. Uh, so one of the things that's coming up right now is um, in the classroom for uh, teachers who want to share like a chapter of a book and um, you know, or more than one chapter. Um, and for the most part, if, if it is more than one, I have, of course am having the, them have the students purchase it, but then it comes up to the out of print books that are not readily available on the market that they want to use. And, um, and that is causing a conundrum because the amount they want to use is outside of the um, one chapter 10% general rule of thumb but the book itself is not generally available. Um, and I do have copies in the library, like maybe a, three or four, so. Yeah, yeah. That's a great question. Thank you for asking that. That's an especially great question because for the past decade or so, there's been litigation. So we've got some very specific guidance on use. The, what they call the Georgia State case um, has to do specifically with what they call electronic reserves. Um, and it, it ended out being a really great illustration about sort of the strengths and limitations of fair use and the way that, as we talked about, doing fair use is like making soup, not about sort of walking through a checklist, right? Um, you could imagine a very mechanical, what are you doing? Nonprofit and educational, check, fair use strong. What are you using? Well, the book is, is more factual and more descriptive, but you know, it's, it's probably some of each of those and the second factor doesn't even really matter. So eh, we don't know how much. Well, it's more than this 10% or one chapter, which in some communities is a rule of thumb. So X, you know, not good there. Market some, you know, you could do it sort of uh, mechanically like that. I want to suggest two things. First, I want to suggest that that 10% or one chapter is not a hard and fast rule. It appears nowhere in the statute. Um, and the courts that considered the Georgia State case said explicitly over-reliance on any sort of mechanical limit like that. 9% yes, 11% no, one chapter yes, two chapters no, is in deep tension with the way fair use is supposed to work. Um, when I talk to faculty, we often say something like, well, if it's 10 or 15%, you're probably okay. If it's 40 or 50%, I start to feel a little uncomfortable. But those are general guidelines, not hard and fast rules. You'll sometimes people say like, well, no more than 30 seconds of this or no more than one stanza of that. Those are always rules of thumb that communities have developed to try to think through the issues, not hard and fast rules that determine yes or no fair use. The other thing that I really like about that case is it illustrates the way that these four factors really do get sort of stirred together. It's not about, well, I had three factors, so I win, and you only had one factor, so you lose, or that sort of thing. It is about taking the four factors sort of in totality. Um, and in this case, if a work is an orphan work, meaning it's not available for sale on the new market, and there is no market substitution, if you've got your first factor and your fourth factor, I would start to feel really, really, really good about fair use. Because your third factor, how much, shouldn't be tied to was it 10% versus 20%. It should be how much do you need to do the good work that you're doing. And if what you need to do is copy 30% of the book, the first fact factor and third factor support you. And all that's left is the fourth factor. And if you were you know, photocopying entire textbooks that were for sale and there was an active market, that would start to feel like a, a tough fair use argument to make. But if there's no market substitute in the first place, you start to say, well, what I'm doing is clearly fair use. I'm using the appropriate amount and there's no market substitute. I start to feel like fair use very strongly supports the stuff that I do. So if you change the market substitution factor, that's what Georgia State was about. 
when there is a readily available licensing market, then we need to be very careful about what we're doing and about how much we're using. And that's where maybe 10, 15% starts to feel like a much safer space than 25, 30%. When there's no market substitution, that's some good soup. So really, really good question. The other thing to say here is that the Georgia State case lasted for more than a decade because courts kept going back and forth, trying to figure out how to operationalize this stuff. Everybody, all the judges and all the courts agreed, this is pretty much fair use as long as you're not taking too much. Um, it's not transformative, which is a term I'm gonna introduce in a second, but it's pretty clearly society serving. So as long as you're doing teachery stuff and you're not taking too much, it's probably fair use. But despite that general agreement, how to operationalize it across the specific hundred and some objects that were being referred to, <laughs> really smart judges spent a lot of time hashing over. So rather than wait 10 years to hash it all out, I would think in terms of those four factors and do your assessment in those ways. If what you're doing is appropriate in terms of the amount and either there's no market substitution or you're in that sort of lower end, you know, eight, 10, 12, 15% range, I would feel pretty confident about fair use in that context. But of course, I have to say every institution has a different risk tolerance. Uh, some libraries say, yeah, go nuts, do a lot. Some libraries say like, we just don't do e-reserves or we're not gonna let our teachers do e-reserves. So what I, a lawyer say is one thing, what your boss or your counsel's office says is <laughs> maybe more directly controlling on the way you can understand risk in your work situation. So really, really good question about fair use. If you want to dig more into Georgia State, I'm happy to do that. I can nerd out about that all day. Um, but quickly, I want, I want to make sure we get a chance to get to your questions as well. So that's the those four factors are sort of the four factors that, that the statute give us, that the written law gives us. The statute says explicitly, and courts have affirmed, that there are other factors that can be considered as well. These are meant to be illustrative, not sort of the entirety of the things that can be considered. Um, so, so the soup analogy again, does it smell good? Does it feel right? Does it feel like what a responsible person would do? And in fact, one of the resources that I have linked at the bottom there are these sets of codes of best practice for fair use in. Um, and what, what that is, is they brought together a lot of practitioners in a field to talk about what a good professional does. What does a good documentary filmmaker do if they get an amazing interview, but the radio's on in the background? Do you have to clear the seven seconds of that stupid song that was playing in the background while this person poured out their heart to you? Or do you have to trash the whole documentary because the radio got left on? And they said like, no, of course not. That's what fair use is for. You're not featuring the song, you know, to soundtrack the movie, this the radio was on in the background. There are lots of those codes. Um, there's one that was created for libraries and librarianship specifically that's particularly useful and addresses the e-reserves question that we were just talking about in a pretty thoughtful way. Uh, we just released one for open educational resources and open educators that I'll, I'll commend to you because I think it's a nice way to get into a lot of the questions about pedagogy writ large, not just about open educational resources. Um, so those should be linked at the bottom. The library one and the open education one I think are especially useful. So that's the fair use piece. The other way courts have often thought about fair use is they've taken these factors and they've sort of synthesized them into a question about whether your use is transformative or not. Are you taking something and just free writing on it to, to benefit yourself or are you changing it in some way, either by changing the physical thing or by recontextualizing it in a way that brings new meaning, message or use? And a nice example of transformation here is exactly what we're doing with this photograph. The sign was created for one purpose, to sell a house uh, in a weird way. The photograph was taken for a completely different use. So this person has already sort of made some transformational use where they're saying, I'm sharing this for comedic purposes, not trying to sell the house. We here have further transformed it in, in a second or third way to say now this is going to be used as an object of pedagogy to illustrate an idea or purpose. When, right, the, the thing has not changed. You can still see the original sign in that picture. So the thing itself has not been physically transformed, but the uses we have made from object of business to object of humor to object of instruction and pedagogy is exactly what courts mean when they, when they talk about a transformative use. So along with feeling good about those four factors we talked about, I feel really good about my use as transformative as well. So for myself, 
I think I'm done with these questions. I'm going to answer yes, my use is permitted by fair use. I'm going to include this in the doc here and move on with my life. If for some reason I didn't feel confident that this use was fair, or if a decision maker above me said, you might think it's fair, we don't believe in fair use, you can't do that, then I would go to the last factor, do I need permission and how can I get it? Uh, it should be said that permission always cures copyright issues as long as that permission comes from the rights holder themselves. Um, so if I wanted to use this picture, I would need to think about the photographer and maybe also the creator of the sign. Uh, that would be really hard for me to do. Um, in moments where it's really hard to get permission, that often feeds back into the market substitution conversation. If there's not a clear way to get permission for something, and this is the textbook that's out of print that we talked about, you can start to make some assumptions about whether there's a market that you're undercutting, right? If nobody will sell me a thing, it's hard to argue that I'm undercutting their market for that thing since they won't sell it in the first place. But so that last factor, I'm going to say, eh, because I don't really care, it's fair use, um, but it would be hard to do anyway. And then maybe the last, last factor after that, who will be upset if I do this? I talked about that as a framing factor. Um, I think Margot would be nothing but thrilled to know that her funny photograph is being used as an object of instruction. I, if, if she found out, she would go somewhere between, okay, I don't care, and oh, that's neat. So I'm not concerned that she's gonna sue me even if she finds out. And by the way, I think I'd win if she did. Um, the, the real estate company that made the sign might be concerned, but I'm not sure. And I think they would look pretty bad if they brought a lawsuit against some friendly librarian who was teaching about copyright for use of their for sale sign. And then when they lost, they'd look even worse. So that last framing question helps me rethink the market substitute conversation and also my general posture. I'm a little more comfortable being aggressive in the way I think about fair use because I know there's not somebody out there who's likely to be furious and start sending nasty cease and desist letters at me right away. On the other hand, if I was using an image that I knew was gonna make somebody mad, I'd be more careful, but I might also be more likely to rely on fair use. Because if you were using something in a way that was really gonna make me mad, I would never give you permission. And one of the things that fair use is supposed to be a safety valve for are situations where the rights holder is never gonna give permission to do something, right? Because we need to get the expression out there. So those are the five questions that I wanna, I wanna make sure you have in front of you when you think through all of your copyright and fair use questions. Is it protected? Is there a license? Is there a specific exception? Is that exceptional exception fair use useful? Um, and then can I get permission? All sort of framed in terms of, do I need permission and can I get it? And who will be upset if we did this? Any questions about my hypo? That took a little longer than I expected, but I think we got some really good stuff out there. So I'll, I'll, I'll take a, a 10 count if you want to pipe up and ask questions. And if not, I'll jump into the questions you've added in the bullets here. Excellent. I have either answered your questions well or put you to sleep or some combination of the two. Either way, I'm going to continue talking. Um, these are really, really good questions in the chat and I'll, I'll uh, just take them from the top. Other people, please feel free to add them to this doc where I'm looking right now um, or to share them in the chat as well. The first question has to do with section 108. One of the right section 108, remember, is that libraries exception, the exception where Congress said stuff that libraries do often needs copyright to get out of the way. Um, the question is about whether VHS is an obsolete format. Um, there is a specific part in section 108 that permits us to do some copying and format shifting if a format is considered obsolete. So if you find an old, you know, I think an eight track is considered obsolete. Now some old format that can't be played anymore, we have the right without getting permission to update that in certain ways. Um, the test for whether some, a format is obsolete is whether you can buy new and for a reasonable price the player for that thing. Um, the last time I checked, you could still buy kind of a combination Blu-ray DVD or Blu-ray VHS players. Uh, I haven't checked on that in several years though. So the answer to the question is it should be getting close, but I'm not sure. Um, what I would do to check on that is to is to go to Best Buy and Amazon and three other websites or just go to Google or your search engine of choice and just type in like buy VHS, buy VCR. And if they are available, um, then the 
not not on the used market for five hundred thousand dollars, but new in store in box. Um, it's not obsolete. If those are not available, then the format is considered obsolete, and you can do that digitization in different ways. Um, so the question is, what if that VHS reel to reel copies are available via a streaming license? Um, that's a great question, and the answer is. The obsolete format does not give you the right to stream, but it does give you the right to do that format shifting that we talked about before. Um, so yeah, and we can't afford it often those streaming services aren't permitted in the context of library sharing anyway, right? Um, so that's a, that's a really good question. The answer is you can update it to a new format, but that sort of exists parallel to the streaming copy, if that makes sense. So, so the question is, and is this film or TV show or whatever available in a format. It's um, whether the format that you have it in is obsolete or not. Really good question. Um, would streaming a video to an in-person class be in violation of the streaming agreement even though it is in class? Yes, this is an issue I've been wrestling with quite a bit recently. Um, well, the, and the answer unfortunately is I'm not sure. That, so, the, so the issue is in order to rely on that 1101 face-to-face teaching exception, you have to have a legal copy, a copy that you have a legal right to possess and use. Um, and folks like Netflix have been very cagey about whether they permit classroom use or not. Um, I can go online and I can find you examples of reps from Netflix saying, of course we permit that kind of use. We love it when that happens. I can find other examples of reps from Netflix saying, no, we would never permit that. The license says very explicitly for personal use only, that would be a violation of the terms of use. Um, Netflix is kind of trying to have their cake and eat it too in different ways. It's probably relevant that Netflix has taken a few films. Um, Ava DuVernay's film about uh, prison is, is one I know that, that and have provided educational licenses for those things. So they might say, for some films, we have offered educational licenses. If it's not there, since you know we do it sometimes and we didn't do it there, you can't make that assumption. But the actual answer to your question is we don't know for sure. So different institutions have taken different postures on that issue. And that's why I had that five plus one question. The, the real issue kind of comes down to is Netflix going to be mad about it enough to make a stink about it because the law is is just unclear. 1101 has never been litigated. Nobody has ever been sued based on that face-to-face -face teaching exception. The good news means nobody's ever been sued in the whole history of the time it's been there. The bad news is we don't have any judicial gloss to help us interpret and understand those things. So um, that's kind of a non-answer, which is, I guess, what us Weasley lawyers specialize in. Um, but But what, what I hope you will take from that is there is not a clear no out there. So if you feel it's pedagogically relevant, it's not undercutting the market, you're still paying them for the subscription. Um, there are institutions out there that have said that risk feels okay to me. So the next question is, would the market substitution factor have the largest impact on using YouTube copies of works that are unavailable? Um, so so the, the situation here, as I understand it, is there's like a movie that's that's not available, that's out of print, but some kind soul has uploaded a version of it to YouTube. And so you could send people to the YouTube link, but are there copyright issues there? The first thing to say is that's YouTube's problem and not your problem. Unless you uploaded it yourself, the people that, that might potentially get in trouble are, in theory, YouTube could get sued, but they're probably not going to. More likely the person who uploaded it could get a copyright strike and have it taken down. Um, obviously, there is a there's a there's a notice and takedown policy, and then there's a way to challenge takedown and say this is fair use and to put it back up. Um, if you are just pointing to a link, you are not part of that conversation happily because there's no legal risk. Sadly, because that means at any moment your YouTube link can break. Right? Um, if there was a lawsuit that went to court, the fact that the work is unavailable would be tremendously important, absolutely. And the good news from our perspective is the rest of the fair use analysis looks better for us as educators or librarians than it does for YouTube, which is monetizing that stuff and making a bunch of bunch of bunch of money, right? YouTube arguably is making a commercial use rather than a sort of non-commercial educational use. Um, so courts would look at all, all four of those factors and ask the transformation question as well. Um, but if a work is out of print, that weighs heavily on the market substitution factor. So if you can assume that the other factors are, are in pretty good standing as they usually are for us as educators and librarians, that's kind of the, the last hurdle, the last roadblock. So if that one goes away, I start to feel pretty good about fair use in that context. Really good questions. 
Uh, we use scientific diagrams in our course materials and presentations online. If we cannot source them, are we allowed to recreate or redraw them? Um, these are really thoughtful questions. Scientific diagrams also raise a really interesting issue. Uh, early on, I said quickly that, that copyright doesn't protect facts and ideas. A lot of charts and diagrams are mostly just a bare reproduction of facts and ideas. You know, th this is rainfall over the course of a year. This is percentage change in, in this context or whatever. Um, and exactly as you say, there are only so many ways to visually show that. So, so a couple of terms that a court might use, they might say that this is an idea, not expression, right? When, when an idea can only be presented in a certain way, nobody can own that thing. So there's no copyright issue here. They might say that the idea and expression have been merged, what's called the merger doctrine. That's also language that's used when there's only one or a very few ways to show something. Um, so again, no copyright, no issue. You're done at the first question and you can move on with your life. Um, or they might say there's what they sometimes call a thin copyright protection, meaning there's only copyright in the way the unprotectable ideas are sort of selected and arranged. Um, the example that you sometimes hear is the telephone book can't be protected by copyright because it's just alphabetical. But the yellow pages where people are doing sorting based on topics, and these are the people we're going to call plumbers, and these are the people we're going to call electricians, the numbers are still not protectable, but the selection and arrangement might be. So you could imagine a diagram where the underlying facts aren't protected, but the selection and arrangement might be. In that context, redrawing in a new and different way might be meaningful. But if you are truly recreating them in a way that looks exactly the same or legal phrase substantially similar, you are not better off than you were before. So, so the answer is either there's not a copyright issue here in the first place, you don't need to redraw it. Or if there is a copyright issue, redrawing it doesn't really help you unless you are changing it in some important way. So I would either use it confidently because there's not a copyright issue here, or I would say redrawing isn't really gonna help us. We've gotta figure out permission or do something else. Um, if the copyright issues are thin at best and there's not a clear way to get permission, whether you call that fair use, merger, idea, expression, or whatever, the answer is probably you can do it. But, but thinking about those issues is exactly the right, the right way to think about those issues. Really good questions. I see more popping in here as well. I'll say we're about five minutes out. Um, if at three you have to run to another meeting, you won't hurt my feelings, but I can hang out for a few extra minutes to answer questions if that's useful for folks. So the question here is for movies in person with enrolled students, the exception being perhaps films that offer a separate classroom license version, or is that BS? That is BS. Well, that's mostly BS. Um, you can show, you can perform or display any lawfully acquired film as part of classroom instruction, full stop. The fact that somebody added some sort of classroom license on there doesn't take away your ability to do that. Um, if you ask me if you can give me money, I'll say, sure, I'll take some licensing fees, even if I'm not really entitled to them, because why the heck not? Um, I could imagine a situation where somebody is not confident that their use falls within 1101 because they're, you know, we're going to show it to the enrolled students and any of their friends they bring. Or we're going to show it to enrolled students and we're also going to show it as part of a student club and open it up to the public, right? You're doing something more than 1101 comprehends. That's where a classroom license might be relevant. Um, and I do know some of my media librarian friends will pay for a license basically just to be on good terms with the vendor or the creator. They'll say like, I don't, I don't know that I need to pay for this, but the, the fee is small and the relationship matters more to me than the legal nuances, so I'm going to do it. That's a choice they're making, not something the law compels them to do, though. So if you're within the bounds of 1101, the fact that somebody has made up some new, not real classroom license doesn't change that fact. Assuming you have a lawfully acquired copy, right? You have a VHS tape or a DVD or whatever. If they're selling you a digital streaming version, they can obviously attach licenses to it in different ways. Good questions. Other considerations for permission, social justice and equity, giving credit to the creators. That's exactly right. So I, I said that fair use, they have those four factors, quote, and others. Other considerations, both legal and not legal, but maybe more important, are exactly the things you're talking about, right? If, if you take something from a piece of indigenous knowledge and you make a copy and you feel like fair use has your back, you may still feel like, well, that's pretty gross. I feel like the law lets me do that, but that doesn't mean I feel good doing that. Um, giving credit can be similar. If you ask 
most anybody in any field, especially in libraries and education, they will say that credit and attribution matter a lot to them. Copyright law has almost nothing to say about what, when do you need to do attribution? What should attribution look like? Who's first author on a paper? Copyright law just doesn't wade into that stuff at all. So that kicks it back to uh, norms of professionalism and ethical issues, which are obviously just as, if not more important than your legal issues. But your lawyer can't tell you much about, should you do attribution? How can you do attribution? That's just not their, their area of expertise. Um, one of the reasons that I often encourage people I work with to put a Creative Commons license on there is that can create a legal obligation to give credit, right? A CC BY license says, you might not have had to before, but to comply with the license, you do have to give me credit now. So that's, that's an example of taking something that's generally more ethical and bringing it into the legal context in that way. Um, but I love that somebody shared those as considerations, both that a judge might consider and that we as human beings in the world definitely want to consider. So the next question is, what if you're just allowed specific numbers of views, but no downloads of chapters? Um, one of the great existential challenges in librarianship and education recently is as we have moved away from physical materials that we own to digital things that we license, we move out of the realm of copyright and thus fair use and all those exceptions and into the realm of contracts and licenses. Um, when you are acquiring something based on a license, you are bound by the terms of that license. Um, if a license is silent on fair use, you might say, I retain all those rights. But if a license specifically says you may only do this thing and you agree to that license, you are bound by that license. It's one of the reasons I spend a lot of time uh, pushing back on licenses throughout my day with individuals and with the library as well. Next question, how do you determine what's enriching the world versus enriching yourself? If I wanted to write a book that included parts of somebody else's poem and sell that book for money, which side of the spectrum? That's a really good question. And it again points to the sort of soupiness of fair use, right? That there, there isn't necessarily a, a stark divide between enriching the world and enriching yourself. Um, Non-commercial uses are often more favored and make your soup taste a little better, but there are tons and tons and tons of leading fair use cases where clearly commercial for-profit uses were found to be fair. The only reason we had the VHS conversation before was in the 80s, there was a case before the Supreme Court where they considered whether the, v, the VCR was permitted or not. There was a lawsuit that said, these are just piracy machines, you shouldn't allow VCRs to exist in the world. And courts said, Sony, you're going to make a lot of money selling these VCRs. Nevertheless, using a VCR is permitted by fair use. So the enriching the world versus enriching yourself stuff isn't a, you know, it's, as you note, it's often some of each of those things. Um, and it's definitely not dispositive in terms of whether your use is fair or not. Generally speaking, if you can make a case that your use is transformative, um, right? I'm writing a book about the way poems have changed over, the over time, or the way poems in different parts of the world reflect the different values of those parts of the world. I'm using this poem for purposes of commentary, critique, illustration. Those sorts of transformative uses are maybe even more important than the enriching the world versus enriching yourself question. Um, but maybe parallel to that, if there's a sense I'm, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants to move our understanding of knowledge forward, that's a better argument than I thought there was a great way I could get rich by just ripping off a bunch of people's poems. So again, that's a, that's a pretty soupy answer, but we're talking about a pretty soupy area of the law in some ways. Okay, we're right at three. I'm gonna answer this last question. If you wanna add others, that's fine. And if you need to go to another meeting, I totally understand that too. Um, at what point does use become commercial over educational? If we fundraise even as a college, does that matter? Um, a lot of the laws are concerned with the status of the institution. Uh, so there's, there's the section 1101 face-to-face teaching exception specifically says nonprofit institutions. So it's not about the behavior, it's about the, the institution that's doing it. Fair use is not like that. Fair use is about the use, not the user, as we say. Um, so that, that leaves us with the question of what's the difference between commercial and educational? And the answer is usually, are we trying to make money off of the thing or are we doing something else and there's some cost recovery built into there? So it's, it's true that, that our, our gate counts and our circulation counts impact the funding we get in the library but nobody would say, therefore, everything the libraries does is commercial, right? But if we started selling things out of the library, that would start to feel like commercial. Um, that's another kind of soupy answer, but I, I know we're at time. Um, 
generally speaking, if, if you are at a nonprofit institution doing the sort of thing that nonprofits generally do, it's going to be considered non-commercial unless you are saying pay for a ticket explicitly to see this movie or give us a hundred bucks and we'll show you this book or something like that. Commercializing the thing itself versus doing an activity that includes th this material in some way. Really, really good questions. I know we're over time, so I'm going to say thank you to everybody who's hung out with me so far. If you have other questions, please feel free to drop them in. If not, I'm going to direct you to the bottom. All of the resources that I talked about and some other really good ones are down here. Um, you can see sort of the, the basics at the top and then it moves through what's Creative Commons, how do we think about the public domain and copyrights duration, um, how do you think it through fair use in different ways. What we didn't get to today was this the sort of the second hypo, Mr. Jem's story time, which has to do with reading aloud. The reason I feel okay that we didn't get to that is there's an article at the bottom here called Can Teachers Read Books Out Loud Online? Actually, yes, that very clearly and succinctly explains why it's absolutely fair use um, when the reading aloud that you're doing is part of your core non-commercial sort of pedagogical purposes. Um, if there's a ton of interest, we can we can jump into that maybe in another webinar. But for now, I just want to I want to point to those resources. Um, I see a couple other questions here, so I'll quickly answer them again. If you have to go, that's totally fine. Um, parody is a core example of transformative fair use. Our, our work around what transformative is comes from a case that deals with parody. Um, Parody specifically is a work that comments on or critiques the original. It takes the original and it says, um, this is limited in this way or silly in this way or this sort of thing. The specific case had to do with a rap group taking an old fashioned Roy Orbison song and saying like, this is a pretty cheesy white bread you know, view of love. Here's what my lived experience has been. There was a sense of talking back to the original. When your parody talks back to the original, borrowing elements from the original in order to respond is what courts generally mean when they talk about parody. Uh, the other question are streamers that play entire games online violating copyright law. Um, that's a good question. And it's governed both by the law itself and by the terms of use of places like Twitch where streaming tends to happen. Um, the, the purely answer is probably the on the ground answer is most companies have figured out that it's incredibly good for their business if streamers are talking about their stuff. That's why Disney has stopped suing all the little girls in Elsa and Anna outfits saying let it go because it's much better for their business to let those fans fan out than it is to sue them. Nintendo has certainly been at the other end of that spectrum in some different ways. Um, so Nintendo has the ability to send copyright takedown notices that Twitch will generally enforce. I think they are not wise to do that. Speaking of views versus downloads, this is from a digitized textbook. Does it still fall under copyright? Um, the copyright exists regardless of the format. We generally say that copyright is format neutral. So a print book versus a scanned book versus me singing a book in the format of an opera, copyright's the same in all of those things. Um, the TEACH Act specifically says you can show people things, but you can't let them download as a way of recreating the sense that you can show a movie in physical class, but you can't give them copies to take home with them. Um, that's the main space where that, that distinction between viewing versus downloading comes into effect. Uh, but obviously there's different market harm there if I show you something versus I give you a copy to take away with you. I think I've found most of the questions now. Thanks again for hanging out for an extra five minutes with me. This has been a 